Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so many people that I know, Kathleen Duell, I'm so happy to see you a minute ago, and Pat and Wendy and all kinds of people. So I just want to put in the uh, disclaimer that my focus tonight is more for beginning people who are newer to mediumship, mm -hmm. just um, sort of as a request from Wendy that, you know, sometimes I have a soft spot in my heart for beginners because uh, after less than five years, I consider myself to be a, certainly a, be a beginner. And uh, so for those of you who are battle-worn <laughs> battle -worn veterans, uh, this may be redundant, but uh, so take it for what it's worth. Um, the other thing I want to say is that nothing I'm about to say, hi, Ellen, uh, nothing I'm about to say is meant as absolute truth. Others with differing uh, experiences may well have differing opinions. So what I'm going to share tonight represents my understanding as of this point in time and based on my personal experiences. And the minute I share it with you, hopefully my perspective will continue to expand. So I don't believe there really are absolute truths. If we look at all of human history, it's always been partial information until we got more information. And I think often of those people waving to Christopher Columbus as he was uh, sailing away that day and they knew he was gonna sail off the edge of the world. And that was their truth. And turned out that they got some more information when he came back. So I think that the secret in my mind to mediumship is to stay as open as possible. And yet it's tempting because the way that we're taught to learn in school in most of the Western world is you study for the right answer, you take the test, you pass the test, you got the right answer, and you hold on to that right answer. Right answer. And as soon as we decide, if you think about genocide and herbicide and homicide, it kills means to kill something, right? And when we decide, we kill the other options. So be careful about the things that you decide and think about it in those terms. If you've decided that something, fill in the blank, is the absolute truth, are you cutting yourself off from more information? And in this conversation, more information from spirit. If we decide on an absolute truth, it also blocks spirit's ability to communicate with us in my, in my personal experience. So if we could think of truth as more a river rather than the rock of Gibraltar, I think it keeps us in a more fluid place. Um, so there's a gentleman called C.W. Leadbeater who lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And there's a quote of his that's a favorite of mine that I wanted to read to you. And it goes as follows. It is one of the commonest of our mistakes to consider that the limit of our power of perception is also the limit of all that there is to perceive. That place where we decide. So there's a story in order to start tonight. First, I guess I should backtrack. And for those who don't uh, aren't familiar with my story, on July 17th, 2017, the love of my life was hit by a car and uh, transitioned, uh, catapulted to the afterlife or the spirit world or call it what you will. And that phone call that morning ripped me from the moorings of my life. I was suffocating on my grief because of the belief that I had lost Scott. And the spirit world saved my life. And so my commitment is to serve the spirit world for the rest of my human life, for the gift that I was given by Scott and those in spirit to show me that my belief, my understanding up to that point was not so much wrong as partial. And I was given more information. I was given the gift of more information. Um, <clears throat> so could I, and you don't have to do the raise your hand thing, but I can see some of you, but if you can any, can you raise your hand if you struggle at all with the idea of meditation? 
<laughs> so there's a few people. So I'm hoping uh, this is, I'm very excited about what I'm going to share with you about meditation because for me, I spent 40 years of my life trying to figure out meditation and how to make, how was it even interesting or meaningful? I, I got zero. I got nothing for 40 years. And after Scott passed, and I had a number of readings from different meeting, mediums, and the collective message was, if I want to connect with spirit, the avenue was, was meditation. And I didn't know how to get from where I was to where that would be meaningful. And I hope that some of you will have a pad and, uh, pad and pen, because some of this might be things you want to reference back to. But because I am a clinical researcher, I tend to probably take a two left brain approach to a very right brained activity. So you'll have to bear with me, but I have a formula for meditation that may be helpful. So if you think about A plus B equals C, if A is the activity, which is meditation, that's the non-variable. That's, that's the thing that stays the same. A is meditation plus B, which is your intent your intention is the variable. So that's the B equals C, the outcome. So if your intention is to sit in bliss beside higher consciousness and think no thoughts, you're going to get a different result than when Scott died. All I wanted was to connect with Scott. So I had a very different intention than a lot of people and their meditation. So if you think about it, you can switch that B depending on your mood, depending on what your aspirations are at any given time, change the bees, change the outcome. And so what I would tell you is that I shifted it for myself. Um, Suzanne Giesman had done a reading for me. And at the end of that reading, she was the one who broke the bad news to me that if I wanted to connect with Scott, I was going to have to learn to meditate. And after a couple of expletives on my part, she said, no, think about it a different way. She said, prayer is asking and thanking. And meditation is listening. And that changed everything for me. Because I can't sit in a lotus position and still my mind, but I can listen. So the guidance I was given was to always meditate with a notepad in my lap. If my B is to connect to spirit, then meditate with a notepad in my lap. And I close my eyes. My, my process is I close my eyes with that notepad in my lap and my pen in my hand. And I just, I don't have to still my mind and not think thoughts. But what I do is I listen. And I open my eyes long enough to write down the thoughts that occur to me. And over time, I began to understand the difference between my thoughts, I need to get new tires, and thoughts that spirit might be able to push through from my subconscious into my conscious awareness. So for me, when I shifted from meditation as stilling my mind and lotus position and whatever the heck I thought it was for 40 years that didn't work, and I just call it listening practice. Because ultimately, as a medium, that's what we're doing. Whether it's, you know, whatever the etheric senses are, whether it's listening or seeing. And thank you, Annie, so much for shaking your head. It's very helpful. Um, just listen. And spirit will teach you. And I can tell you that the cheapest school you will ever attend is your own meditation. And if you ask, if I could give you one gift tonight more than anything else, it is one word, and that is ask. Too often people say, well, all you have to do is set your intention. And I disagree with that. Intention is fine, but it's kind of like I can intend to go to my car to go to the grocery store, but I got to take an action if I'm actually going to get the work done. So to ask, if someone, if I show up at your house and you invite me in and I go to your dining table and I sit down and I silently intend for you to fix me dinner, I'm probably going hungry. But if I ask you, hey, you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of hungry, Wendy, would you be willing to make me dinner? 
she's probably going to agree to that because she invited me in in the first place. So remember to ask. That's the biggest gift. And it's the thing I think we forget the most. But there's another story that I want to share with you that sets the tone for the rest of what I want to share with you. In the 11th century, there was a Tibetan Buddhist philosopher called Milarepa. I'm probably getting his name pronounced wrong, but bear with me. So Milarepa had lost his entire family due to violence in the region. And so after the death of his family, he retired to a cave in the high Himalayas. And he planned to spend the rest of his life, however long that was, in the silence in this cave by himself. And what transpired in him sitting in the silence and listening, his listening practice, led him to the discovery of his gifts as a yogi. And so over time, he students came. And the miracle of Milarepa, which you can still go into the, to Nepal now and see this cave, if you can get to 15,000 feet, is that he would stand in that cave and he would hold out his left hand and he would put it against the stone wall and he would push into the stone as though it were a sponge. And when he removed his hand, his handprint stayed in the stone. And so for centuries, people have been going to see his handprints in the cave because there are multiples. And so one traveler asked the guide, what is this and how is this possible? And what the guide's response was that the great teacher's meditation teaches us that he knew that he wasn't separate from the stone. And so my assertion is if we can understand that we are not separate from spirit, our loved ones don't die and go someplace far away above a cloud somewhere. What if heaven is real and it's in there in the kitchen and you're in the living room and that they're far closer, maybe at a different octave. But if we take it from not being separate, that possibility shifts what becomes possible for us. So the other gift I want to give to you is this idea of a phrase which I use all the time, which is what if. And what I mean when I say what if is if there's a spectrum, you can't really see if I spread my arms all the way out, but if there's a spectrum and over here is not possible and not true, and over here is absolutely possible and absolutely true, do you see that both of those are a full cup? Both of those have no more room for new information. Yet the midpoint on the scale acknowledges both possibilities. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Maybe it's real, maybe it isn't. But what if, so in the, in the four and a half years since Scott passed, I have encountered so many things that I would never, as a scientist in a million years, have believed would be possible. One of which, Wendy knows, I attended a seance with David Thompson and Scott materialized in that seance and spoke to me and kissed my forehead twice. And yet I would not have imagined that possibility except for the gift that spirit gave me, which is what if? What if that was real? What if that really was him? And someone says, well, what if it isn't? but it still holds space because it's not just about us. It's about if I say to spirit, what if you're really here? That in, that's an encouragement. And that encouragement, I think it is, uh, is food for them to keep trying to get through to us. So um, there was a researcher, an astrologer, an early psychical researcher, uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, called Camille Flammarion. And there's a quote I wanted to read from Camille Flammarion. We know nothing absolutely. All of our judgments are relative and therefore partial and incomplete. Scientific sagacity, discernment, 
consists in being very careful how we deny the possibility of anything. So I try to stand in that place of what if, and that has shifted my ability. And I don't, I'm not as quick to decide and kill the other possibilities. Um, I believe it was Scott, the medium Scott Milligan, I'm not positive, but I'm gonna give him credit because I can't remember who else it, it was, um, had said, don't try to limit a limitless power. And what spirit is capable of, if we can bring ourselves into that what if place is more than we could possibly imagine. And the last thing I wanted to say about meditation, because for me, and I just have to give a plug for Wendy and Victor's book, because if you're a science geek like me and you want the facts, you want the science and something that really points towards all of the science that's been done over the years to prove that this is real, I highly recommend this book. Um, but there's a gentleman who uh, is called Itzhak, which is I-T-Z-H-A-K, for those of you writing it down, Itzhak Bentov. And to me, the way that I think of it is if something is real, then it needs to be provable. And that's why Victor and Wendy's book was so helpful, because there was a lot of scientific research and evidence. And so with regards to meditation, I wanted to read what Itzhak Bentov had to say, because this, and again, not everybody wants the science, but I found that it's actually very helpful. So this, uh, it's a short uh, passage from him, but it explains some of the mechanism of action, if you will. Consciousness opens up when there is a synchronization of the two hemispheres of the brain. The head becomes an antenna with an energy field around it capable of both sending and receiving information. Through meditation, activation of kundalini energy or energy and the resonant state of our body enables higher perceptions to become possible. So our senses are an extension of our nervous system. So if you think about what people call your chakras, or I would say your energy centers, that's part of the nervous system that creates the radio station that is you. So as you meditate, you energetically bring yourself into merged resonance as you fine tune your nervous system through meditation. And a system that comes into harmony with itself becomes a very powerful and capable of connecting with higher consciousness. And what is possible from that point is infinite. So to me, it's kind of like you, the term practicing medicine. I think that mediumship is an art that is a practice based in science. But the art of it is the fact that each of us has a different expression. So I'm not a big believer in rules. I know that there are guidelines in mediumship that I think are important to be respectful of. You know, guidelines to be honest, to be authentic, to do no harm to do the best that you can to serve spirit. But the rules that say you must do it this way or you absolutely need to do it that way, I'm not as much a fan of that. And I suppose the reason for speaking that out loud is to sort of give some permission to experiment and find your own unique artistic expression of the art of mediumship. Um, I know that <clears throat> many mediums use symbols. I don't have that capacity. I'm a pretty smart girl overall, but trying to remember that a red rose means this and a white cake means that, I don't have that possibility. I don't have that capacity. And it takes, it, I break the link if I'm trying to remember that. So again, look at what works for you and don't believe that you have to quote unquote follow somebody else's rules. It is, you are an artist. And so look for your artistic expression of mediumship. Um, so how many times, uh, if I, again, you could just feel free to show your, uh, you don't have to raise the little electronic hand, you can just raise your hand, but how many of you have ever had the experience where it feels like you're making something up in your head? You know, like, okay, 
where did that come from? I must have made it up. So I have a little exercise towards the end that we'll do that I can help you to sort of feel what the difference is. But I want to give you some, as a medium, whether you're wanting to just connect with your own loved ones or whether you're practicing to do readings for other people. For me, I didn't set out to be an evidential medium for anybody else other than myself. And Spirit had other plans. But I want to share some stories because I think that stories are such a powerful way of underscoring what's possible, especially when it comes to no's. Meaning, you know, if I'm doing a reading and I ask my, my sitter, you know, I would like you during the reading to, if, if I'm giving you evidence, I will ask you, does that make sense to you? And I'm looking for yes, no, I don't know. My personal belief at this point is there's really no such thing as no. There's yes, and I don't know. Because spirit has a magical ability, it seems, to give us things that later become clear. So I'm going to give you a couple of stories of no's that turned out to be spectacular yeses later on. So I was doing a reading for a woman who was in her 70s and she wanted to hear from her dad who'd passed when he was in his 90s. And he shows up and he's just a lovely guy and he's talking about singing karaoke and he keeps showing me Louis Armstrong in my face like he would tell give all this evidence but then he'd keep in up close he would show me Louis Armstrong's face and I wasn't getting other than oh he must have really loved Louis Armstrong and she said oh yes it was his favorite but he kept showing me Louis like I had missed something so I'll get to that but at some point in the reading he shows me a rocket landing on the moon and underneath it says 1969. And so I asked her, was the 1969 moon landing significant to her or to, between she and her father? And she said, well, you know, I remember it, but it wasn't necessarily significant. And I said, well, just write it down, you know, see if you remember something later. About a month later, she sends me a text message. And during the reading, she'd mentioned that her only child had just had her only grandchild. Anyway, she sends me a text about a month later with a photograph of some friend in Germany had sent a onesie for the new grandson. And on the front of the onesie was a rocket landing on the moon and underneath it said 1969. Now, the thing that's important about that is that seems like they were telling the future, right? because how he gave us evidence of something that hadn't happened yet. And so I, I, I grapple with things that seem too, too magical. And so my understanding as I've considered that is if I'm on a street corner watching a parade go by, the present moment is right here in front of me. And if I look to the right, that's the future because the parade is still coming that direction. So I can look a little ways into the future. And if I turn to the left, I can look a little ways into the past where the parade has gone by. But if I could rise up in a hot air balloon, I can see farther into the past and I can see farther into the future. So that dad was higher up in the hot air balloon, as it were, and he could see already that that onesie was speeding its way across the Atlantic to her house in Florida with the rocket landing on the moon in 1969. So it's just a lovely way where, you know, it's, it's tempting or it's difficult as a medium when you ask, does that make sense? And they say, no, it's like, bah, bah. you know, you feel like, you know, the failure thing because we want to get it right and we get the no's. So, um, I really don't get too worked up about the no's because time and time again, it turns out to not be a no, but an I don't know. So one of my favorites, I had done a mediumship workshop in Santa Fe and um, I, we were paired up and I was doing a reading with a gentleman who's a Hispanic gentleman and there were all these things and information about his you know, they were giving me Spanish words and I didn't even know what the words were, but they were accurate and whatever, you know, so the guy could take pretty much everything I said, except for this RCA porcelain dog. Just like, you know, that funny little dog 
with the black and white, the black ears and the white dog. And I'm like, Spirit is insistent about this porcelain dog. And he's got nothing. He will not take the porcelain dog no matter what. Like, whatever. So that's a no. Wasn't a big no, but it was a no. So I left that day from Santa Fe to drive back to my home in Colorado. And I was out in the middle of nowhere in northern New Mexico, and I had to stop to go to the bathroom. And so I go into this little diner in the middle of nowhere. And I always buy something. And so I asked if this woman had pie as I'm going to the lady's room. And she says, yes, we have pie. So she cuts me a piece of pie. And I sit down when I come back. And I re bend down to take a bite of this pie. And I look up. And there on the counter is that porcelain dog that I saw in the reading with that guy. And it's exactly what I saw. And so then all my little Scooby senses are on high alert because I know that something's supposed to happen with this woman and that it wasn't that guy, that Hispanic guy, it wasn't his family giving me the porcelain dog. It was this other guy, what do you call it, an interloper, stepped in just to make sure that when I got to the pie place, I would realize that something was supposed to happen there. So. The woman came and sat down beside me and just, you know, nobody was there. She owns the place to chit chat. And I knew I was supposed to ask, but, you know, you don't want to sort of be the terrorist medium who, you know, how do you do it in a gentle way where you're not accosting someone with, because I didn't know who wanted to talk to her either. So I said, you know, have you ever watched those shows, you know, those interesting shows where like mediums are on TV, I'm trying to find some creative way to talk about it. She goes, oh, yeah, I love those shows. I said, well, you know, it's interesting because I do that, too. You know, I'm still learning, but I do that, too. And so she said, well, you know, I have a son who passed away. I'd love to. Do you think you could give me a message from my son? So anyway, the short of a very long story is her son came through and gave beautiful evidence and it was a beautiful moment that I wouldn't have noticed. And it was a no, that it was just a no for that guy. So I guess the, the lesson here is pay attention. The sitter needs to pay attention to the nose, but we as mediums need to hold a broader bandwidth of possibility. So I was paying attention. So I didn't miss that when it came up. So uh, take that for what it's worth. Um, anyway, it's pretty cool when stuff like that happens. So um, the thing I want to say about not making it up is, or how, how do you know if you're not making it up, is a phrase that would be good to write down if you're writing things down. And that is, imagination is to intuition as talking is to singing. So you wouldn't be able to sing if you couldn't talk, and you wouldn't be able to intuit if you couldn't use your imagination. And spirit uses the tool of our intuition, I mean, of our, our imagination to give us intuitions, to give us gifts of awareness. And as I said, that's a little, uh, I have a little exercise that we can do that I think will work in this group setting. Uh, so don't let me forget that. But uh, just imagination is to intuition as talking is to singing. Keep that in your mind. Um, so it's important to remember, in my opinion, that mediumship is a faculty. Spirituality is a state of being, but mediumship is just the faculty. It's like knowing how to play the piano or carve trees with chainsaws. It's just a learned skill. And one is not automatically spiritual because one is a medium. <clears throat> and yet, if, <clears throat> if one will pursue a spiritual, more expansive uh, path, excuse me, what it does is it, it's almost like uh, it opens up the doorway for spirit to have more access. 
but I've certainly interacted with mediums that were not spiritual at all, and yet they were still very good technicians of the faculty called mediumship. So I thought, and that, that took a long time for me to sort of wrap my head around that. And I think that it was actually David Thompson, who was the first person who introduced me to that. Uh, David Thompson is a physical medium who's a friend of Wendy and Victor Zamet's. Um, but he was the first person to present that to me as an idea. And it took some time for me to come to understand what that actually meant. Um, so with the, the whole you get no's, what I would say is find a group of people, even if it's just a good friend that you can practice with, where they're not going to hold it, hold it against you when you get it wrong. You got to be, be brave and take risks, but it's easier when there's a net. You know, like the, the trapeze artists don't practice without the net. They practice with the net of having friends that they can trust who aren't going to call you a charlatan or a scammer. It's tricky because we're dealing with people who are in grief and we don't want to cause harm. And we also don't like to be wrong. But how many times are we right? And it, so I'll give you a perfect example of a time when I knew that I made it up in my head. I was doing a reading for a woman and she wanted to hear from her cousin. And this guy had passed and he was by her, passed by a river and it was had to do with drugs and alcohol. And But he was really funny and he was making jokes about being dead, which is kind of tricky because then you don't want to offend the family member because this this person in spirit is making jokes about being dead. So again, there's some nuance where we have to figure out how do you, I mean, you want to be true to what the spirit is saying, but in a way that is responsible to your audience as well. And so he was talking about this nickname that everybody had for him, but he didn't tell me what the nickname was. And then he went on to show me the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile if you're from the United States, you probably know what the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile is. And I was certain that I made that up. So I didn't tell her about the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile. I told her about the nickname, but I didn't tell her. I edited because I thought, I'm totally making that up. So there was enough evidence and she was happy with the reading, whatever. And then I hung up the phone. And then he shows up and he says, what are you doing? You didn't tell her about the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile. You got to call her back. And now I'm totally busted, you know, by the spirit person because now I got to call this woman back and tell her I was holding out on her. So I call her back because he's not going to give up. Uh, he's sort of there's and how it feels. It's almost like there's a pressure. Just come on, come on, come on. You got to call her back. So I call her back and I say, I'm terribly sorry. This is what happened. And I, I felt like I was making it up. So I didn't tell you that he gave me the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile. And she shrieks and she says, that was it. That was the nickname we had for him was Wieners. But if you think about it, how in the world is a spirit person gonna get me to say the word Wiener? If you showed me a package of hot dogs, I would say hot dogs, I wouldn't say Wiener. And if they show me a Wiener dog, I'm probably gonna say a Dachshund. So again, they will be as creative as they need to be. But that was my slap on the hand lesson where you just give it and maybe it would have been wrong, but it was incredibly meaningful for her. And I also listened when I hung up the phone, I listened to what he had to say. So it's not, you know, the reading's over and peace out, I'm done. Keep listening. It's kind of like the porcelain dog. I can't tell you how many metaphorical porcelain dogs I've had since that time where a no turned into somebody else's yes. And maybe that's, maybe that's me not dialing it in as much as I need to, but I'm still learning. So give yourself, be gentle with yourself as you're learning. Um, and don't compare yourself to others, but there, hey, Wendy, um, is William of William and Timmy, is it Cadwell, is that right? Yeah, William Cadwell. Yeah, so William Cadwell is the, pri the lead for David Thompson, this physical medium, his spirit team, this gentleman 
William Cadwell. And I was in a seance with William and he gave me one of the most meaningful pieces of information that I hang my hat on as a medium. And I really hope that those of you writing notes will write this down because to me, it's probably the single most important piece of evidence and it came straight from spirit. And as newbies, it's, or maybe not, not just as newbies, what he said was, with regards to doing readings, don't intend evidence, intend healing. Wow. You know, to me, it's like, don't intend evidence because that's your ego. You want to be right. You want to look good. So every time I set in to do a reading, I stop and I take away my hope that it goes well and I get evidence that's going to be meaningful to the sitter. I have to remember that I serve spirit first and to intend that healing happen and I leave the rest in spirit's hands. Um, and our teachers can give us tools that point us in a direction, but learning in mediumship is not linear and it's not sequential. So you sort of got to stay in this, uh, stay in this flow. But the one thing I wanted to make sure to remember to, to say is that it's important to understand that there can be differences between the energy producing person, which is spirit and the energy receiving person. And that's based on the levels of development of our sensory apparatus. And how we develop our sensory apparatus is through, through meditation and through practice. And so find people you can trust and practice. And I'll tell you what, early on, all I wanted to do was connect with Scott and all these other people in spirit started showing up. And so I asked people, I was too chicken to sit with anybody and actually do a reading because that was way too scary. So what I would do is I would ask friends to give me the name of a loved one and I would meditate and I would ask their loved one to step in and I would just write down notes and then I'd go back and sit with the person and we'd go through the notes. So find whatever way you, <laughs> you need to start as gingerly as you, as you need to but spirit won't let you down. They want us to be successful. And whether that's us being able to connect with our loved ones, our loved ones want us to know that they're there as much as we want to know that they're there. So trust them. If you ever notice the word trust, T-R-U-S-T, -T, what's the word smack dab in the middle? Us, trust us. That's what spirit's saying, trust us. We won't let you down. And every concert pianist started with chopsticks. So be patient with yourself as a beginner. Hey, Karen. And, uh, and, and allow for the chopsticks part of your journey. And know that if you stick with it, spirit will help you. Every single time you sit in that silence, in, and you, you do your listening practice, even though you don't know it, and this is my visual, but spirit is recalibrating, rewiring your brain to better be able to receive information. And all it takes is a little bit of time and a little bit of practice and trust. But the one thing, you know, like if someone says to you about when we talk about love, I want to make an, an important distinction. I know we're, we're getting, uh, I, I know you'll give me the, the signal when it's time, Wendy, but I'm just going to keep rambling until you, <laughs> you tell me going, to stop. Cheryl, it's fascinating. Um, is I make a distinction between capital L-O-V-E and lowercase L-O-V-E. So if you're sitting in a room right now and there's a lamp on, this is, I want to give this to you as a visual. So if you have a lamp on and there's light coming out of that lamp, that light isn't electricity. It's a response to electricity. So it's a response to the source. So sometimes I'll do an exercise with someone and I'll say, okay, I want you to wrap your loved one in a bubble of love, but I don't mean the emotion of love. 
I mean, if you could make it up in your head as a larger embrace, capital L-O-V-E versus the emotion, which is lowercase L-O-V-E, not to signify anything less significant, but just a distinction. If you could expand to a larger embrace, sometimes I'm doing a reading with someone and you get to that, oh my gosh, I got nothing. Then what do you do? And what I do in that moment is I try to go from lowercase L-O-V-E to uppercase L-O-V-E and realize that the source that creates the light coming off of that lamp is what I want to tap into because that's where spirit resides. So how do we tap into that? Um, I want to share a couple more stories. And uh, so I have this friend, and I don't know if you all know the medium uh, Nicole de Haas, but Nicole de Haas is a brilliant uh, physical medium and uh, mental medium in Holland. And she, I might get this slightly wrong, but I don't know if she would call it channeling, but I would call it channeling. She channels a spirit called Silver Cloud. And she wrote a book with, with channelings from Silver Cloud. And so I was with a friend of mine, and it was the anniversary of her husband's uh, passing. And we were spending time together, and I was trying to help her to sort of feel better, and, you know, on a hard day. And in the room, the TV was going, and there's that music station where, you know, you get, like, the songs, it's just music, and then sometimes quotes will come up. But anyway, and it, usually when the song is playing, it comes up the name of the song or the artist or whatever. And so I said goodnight, but she was going to be there with the music playing for a while. And I got down to, I was staying with her, and I got down to my room, and I remembered that I wanted to give her the Silver Cloud book. And I had sort of reached out to her husband, like, come on, we need something out of the ballpark for today. But anyway, I walked back upstairs with the silver cloud book in my hand and it was facing outward. And she saw me coming and she saw the title of the book and her mouth dropped open. And she stared at me and I said, what is wrong? And she pointed at the television. And at that very instant, there was a song on the Muzak station and the title of the song was Silver Cloud. In that very instant, like, isn't that magical? So if we listen, they, and, and again, it's the nuances. I was doing a reading for someone and they were on the phone someplace else. And in the neighborhood, my bedroom window was open and I heard someone pull into somebody's dooryard and honk the horn in a funny way. And I knew in that instance, my Claire Cognizant told me that was significant. And so I said that he's talking about something about a horn honking in a funny way. And that was the most significant piece of evidence that I brought through in that reading. Actually, it was a niece that had passed, but the niece had a handicap and she rode the special bus. And every time the special bus pulled into the driveway, the driver would honk the horn in a funny way. So spirit used the sound in my neighborhood to show me so that I, at that moment, I could give that person that piece of evidence. So again, they'll always take the path of least resistance. If we'll stay open and it's a skill that we develop over time about what's possible. Um, the one thing I forgot to tell you guys before about the old, the old guy with the rocket landing on the moon and he kept showing me Louis Armstrong's picture up close in my face. I got to the end of that reading and I said, what was your dad's name? And she said, Louis. He was trying to tell me his name, but I was blind to that. I did another reading for a woman and this guy shows me James Dean on the motorcycle and he's a you know, rebel without a cause and go through the whole reading. And at the end, he's showing me Jimmy Buffett and I'm not getting it. And I asked her, what's his name? And she said, Jimmy. So we miss things. But over time, as we develop our relationship with spirit, 
we start to understand, oh, I could have had a V8, right? <laughs> Maybe it's, there's a significance here that I'm missing. But I spent my life up until July 17, 2017, July 7, 2017, I spent my life ignorant of my own potential and about what's possible. And now, would I, would I have Scott back? Yes. But the thing I'll tell you is that I get to spend, and this is something that might be hard to wrap your head around, but one day I asked Scott, because he's here every day, and every day I invite him to spend the day with me, and every day he's here. And one day I said to him, okay, when you were here, we had a relationship. Now you're here. What is this? What do we have? And he gave me a word I'd never heard before. I wrote a blog about it. And he said, we have a vibration ship. And isn't that great? Isn't that great? Because we can create new memories with our loved ones. They still exist. And they understand we have free will. And if we don't ask, I don't think it hurts their feelings. I think it thrills them when we do. But if we ask, they'll spend the time with us. They'll make new memories with us. And that's what's possible. And there's a fallacy we have. It's the fallacy of insignificance. Where I was doing a reading for a woman and somehow Abraham Lincoln came up or she wanted, we were going to experiment and see if we could get a message from Abraham Lincoln. So I asked her to wrap Abraham Lincoln in a bubble of love. She's sitting in Philadelphia in front of a statue of Abraham Lincoln. And right as I'm going to ask Abraham Lincoln, I don't know if it's real or not, but we're just having some fun. And I asked her to wrap Abraham Lincoln in a bubble of love. And she, right as I'm about to ask him for a gift, she screams. And I said, what's wrong? She said, there's a bee. Like she was outside and this bee was dive bombing her or whatever. And again, it was a knowing that that was not, a co somebody popped up in the chat, no coincidences. That was a coincidence, I think is what we should call it rather than a coincidence. It's the places where we coincide with spirit. So I knew it was significant. I opened my laptop. I typed in Abraham Lincoln and the bee. Who would have thought that there would be a famous quote that I'd never heard about Abraham Lincoln and a bee. And he said, when I hear a man preach, I want him to look like he's attacking bees or he's fighting with bees or something. But there was a very specific quote about him and bees. And again, if it's just you, you don't have to prove it to anybody else. Have some fun with it. One day I was asking Scott, if he's like, Scott, do you have a message for me today? And I grabbed a book off the shelf, closed my eyes, wrapped him in a bubble of capital L-O-V-E. And I fanned the pages and I opened the book and I opened my eyes after asking him, do you have a message for me today? And the phrase my eyes landed on was, yes, I do. That's what's possible. Dialed in exactly if we can stay in that place of what's possible. So since we're close to the end of this, I just want to share the best story. And it's the most teachable story. I believe Scott gave me this story. And some of you have heard it before. But it's, to me, the most powerful story of what's possible. So when Scott was in a physical body, he lived in Aspen, Colorado. And you don't need a car in Aspen, Colorado. So he rode his bike, walked, or took the bus everywhere because he was a traveler and he didn't want to have to worry about where to park a car. So when we would go visit his 90-year-old dad in Denver, five hours away, we would take my old blue Toyota on road trips to visit his dad. So he passes. I spend a year and some odd learning how to listen. And so I have started this vibration with ship with him and I sort of I know when he's around but it's in my meditation I'd never had him show up sort of not in my meditation but anyway a year and some later it's Thanksgiving day I'm in my car driving to his dad's house for Thanksgiving 
and I'm trying to get a radio station, but I'm in a canyon and it's not working very well. And so I turn off the radio and I'm thinking my thoughts and I come out the other side of the canyon and all of a sudden, I know that he's in the seat beside me. I know it. And I'd never had the experience before or since in such a palpable way. So I reached my hand into the passenger seat and I started talking to him like he was there because he was and thanking him for helping me and to not leaving me just alone in my grief, but helping me to figure this out. And all of a sudden, the palm of my hand, not my thumb or my fingers or my wrist, just the center of my palm started to get hotter and hotter and hotter, like somebody was turning up a stove, almost to the point of ouch. And I said, oh my God, you're totally here and you're totally holding my hand. This is so, so freaking cool. And I hear, because I'm a good listener at this point, I hear in my mind's ear, turn on the radio. So I take the same hand, I'm driving 70 miles an hour trying, you know, to keep on the road. I poke the radio, not knowing where in the scrolly thing, the radio is stuff, but it's a country station because isn't it always a country station? So the lyrics coming out of the radio at that exact moment were, if heaven is anywhere, it's right here, always having your hand to hold. Now I'm burst into tears and I'm laughing and crying and trying not to crash the car and trying to write down enough. I always have a pad and pen. I'm trying to write down enough the lyrics so I can look it up later because I don't know the song. And the next song comes on and it's a song about holding somebody's hand. It's like, okay, okay, okay. I get the message. So I go to his dad's. I spend a couple of days. I come home. And when I get home, I notice the notepad with the song lyrics on it. It's like, oh yeah, I want to look that up. So I go in the house and I look it up and I read the lyrics first. And then I can't believe it. So I'm watching the video and I'm gobsmacked because this isn't just a song about holding the hand of someone you love. It's a song about holding the hand of someone you love while you're on a road trip in an old blue Toyota. Out of the ballpark for Scout Whitlock. And so the lesson, the teachable moment with that is I could have stopped with him holding my hand and not turned on the radio. I could have turned on the radio and not written down the lyrics. I could have written down the lyrics and not looked it up. And there was evidence within the video as well. But so my assertion, my hypothesis, my declaration is that spirit never gives us just one thing. If they can give you a twofer or a threefer, they will. They layer the gifts. And whether we go down the rabbit hole to find them, that's up, that's up to us. But there's always more there than meets the eye. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it, guys. <laughs>